Biden's proposed tax plan receiving pushback not just from Republicans, but also from members of his own party, including Senator Joe Manchin, of course, on that 28 percent corporate tax rate. Also, Senator Bob Menendez isn't happy with the capital gains hike, and Senators John Tester and Mark Warner are apparently unhappy with the heirs tax. Mm. White House economics reporter for The Washington Post, Jeff Stein, he joins us now to discuss. Jeff, let's lay these out. There's, of course, a popular and correct narrative in Washington. The GOP is aligned completely against many of the tax cuts which Biden is proposing. But there's a lot of internal strife there within the caucus. Lay out the different groups, if you will, as what the opposition looks like. Sure. There's. Um, it's really kind of amazing how uh, how much opposition there is among Democrats themselves um, to Biden's tax hikes. There's um, a group of centrists who are concerned both with the extent of it, in particular the corporate rate hikes, the international provisions. So that's one group. There's a group of farm state senators, Senator John Tester, Cindy Axney of Iowa, um, others in in um, farm states that are concerned about proposed tax on heirs. Um, that would increase, uh, you know, the capital gains rate. There are senators from um, New Jersey and Virginia Democrats who are who are concerned about uh, increasing tax rates on investors. There's another group of Democrats in blue states um, on the east and west coast who want um, bigger tax, want big tax cuts, essentially for upper income individuals by repealing the salt cap imposed by Republicans in 2017. And when you put it all together, um, while most Democrats are supportive of the spending side of the White House agenda, the taxes that Biden wants to pay for these measures, over $3 trillion in tax hikes, really, I would say, at best, there's maybe support for about half of that right now among Biden's own party. Um, that's not nothing, but it's it's not enough to really pay for the plans. And so Biden will probably have a choice between you know, his stated desire to pay for these proposals and um, you know, letting the whole thing fall apart. I think there's going to be uh, other pockets of resistance that will grip you know, materialized as we see this unfold. Um, one of the amazing things is that basically nobody in the Senate understands the international provisions, um, which we can get into, but it, it's kind of a mess for sure. How hardened is this resistance? Is this like they just want to register their complaint, but ultimately if Biden's like, no, this is what the bill is, they're going to get on board with it? Or are they actually going to vote against um, whatever the package ends up being if we ever get to there being a package to vote on? Um, because of their objections to these tax hikes on the wealthy? Yeah, I think it's that's a good, really good question. I think it's clear that um, there are off ramps here. There are ways in which that, you know, compromise could be reached. Um, so I think it is true that if the policy does not change at all, a lot of these people would vote against it, particularly, you know, the SALT caucus that has said publicly that they are a no unless the SALT cap is repealed. I think based on some of the conversations I've had, you know, if they lighten the salt cap or double it, you know, so it would go from 10K to 20K, that would probably be enough of a victory to get those guys on board. Um, so, I, you know, I think those provisions could be weakened and still kept at some level. But, I mean, overall, I think it's worth stressing, you know, we've seen an absolutely stratospheric increase in billionaire income, the richest Americans owning more and more and more of the economic pie um, as your viewers well know from you guys. Mm -hmm. um, and Biden walked away even before introducing this plan from many measures, you know, increasing the estate tax, um, you know, not, not to mention the wealth tax proposed by Sanders and Warren. And so that, you know, the, the initial White House offer was already a compromise from what many economists and Democrats think is necessary to deal with this truly, you know, extreme levels of income inequality we have in this country. So, um, that, you know, the fact that they'll be further weakened is really um, uh, worth noting. Yeah. Yeah. So let's talk then, Jeff, about the timeline. As we talked about earlier in our show, it does not look like reconciliation for this fiscal year is going to happen. In your estimation, they say that pushes to the fall. I mean, is that even realistic? Like, given the different camps, the White House does not really seem to be driving the issue here, or at least with some level of urgency and priority. What does that look like? Yeah, I mean, I think we're all sort of doing the mansion mind reading game at this point, which is, you know, it's I was just talking to the White House advisor this morning who was like, like 95 percent of our time is spent like, I mean, that's an overstatement, but and, right. you know, she was sort of joking. But like, it's incredible the extent to which this rides on what mansion and a handful of other centrist Democrats want to do. Obviously, people say that the White House should be driving a firmer bargain with him, but I honestly have no idea what the timing looks like. You know, during the stimulus negotiations, we had 
such a clear, hard and fast deadline. Unemployment benefits were expiring March 15th and I had to get a deal by then. This has no similar forcing action. Um, but obviously the stakes in some ways are, are enormous, particularly if you think that this is really the last time Democrats um, you know, may have a chance to do something big on climate change. Um, and I, I'll just know, I mean, I don't want to sound too macabre, but a lot of the Democratic senators are really, really old. Um, yeah. Many of them in their mid to late 80s, and their majority in the Senate is just one vote. And, you know, I, again, not to like sound too dark, but these are, this is a very, very old body. And if they let this go another year, you know, they run the risk of one of them getting sick or dying. And that could have tremendous consequences for the country for decades, which is a little uh, crazy to think about. And what is your understanding, Jeff, of how much Biden himself is directly involved in these negotiations and also whether he and his aides have been entirely on the same page? Because there were some allegations coming up for Republicans that like Biden promised them one thing and then aides were like, no, 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 we're not doing that. Yeah, the Republicans have tried to say that there's this gap between the White House staff and Biden himself. I'm a little more skeptical of that, I think. Biden, um, from all the reporting I've seen and some people from people I've talked to, he was very encouraged by a lot of that stuff about like he's the next FDR. You know, this is a historic generational presidency. I think he was very, you know, this has been widely reported that he was very miffed about sort of the coverage of him as sort of a lackluster candidate, you know, in, in uh, you know, as a presidential candidate and also that he would be sort of second fiddle to Obama. And so I think his ambitions to do something big and and serious are real and Republicans are kind of wish cast when they suggest that, you know, he is truly this bipartisan moderate at heart and the staff is the problem. I, I don't think that's right. Mm. Um, and I think maybe Biden is a little more polite than um, than the staff has to be or, or sort of, you know, gives himself that wiggle room. But that doesn't mean to me, at least, that um, that he himself is actually pushing for a bipartisan deal that would you know, got a lot of his priorities. I think it is telling that when the White House came out with its counteroffer to the Republicans last week, and a lot of people on the left were very worried that it would get rid of a lot of the priorities. They kept most of the important climate stuff, the elder care stuff. They came down significantly in the top line number, but overall, like the progressive priorities that you care about um, were in there uh, to the White House's credit from the left. And um, yeah. I think that's a reflection of the of, the president himself, um, for sure. And then last question on this, how hard of a line do you think he'll drive on the um, tax increase piece? Is that a place where you feel like he's gonna be open to the complaints from the centrist Democrats, or do you think he's gonna say, no, this is what it is, and this is already a compromised position, this is what we're going forward with? Yeah, that's a, a tricky one. I had a story about, about this kind of issue, and it's, it was weird because Biden came out and himself said, I'm not willing to, I don't remember the exact quote, but I'm not willing to add money to the debt to finance this, which to me seemed surprising. And when I emailed the White House communications department, they came back with a statement saying, you know, that's not a new position. He's just saying that he, you know, wanted to pay for it. He wants to pay for it. Not that he's announcing a new red line, which to me indicated that, you know, I don't want to overstate it, but there seems to be a bit of a gulf on the question of the pay for This is something you hear a lot from Senate staff as well, that a lot of their older bosses um, are much more obsessed with paying for things than mm -hmm. the younger, more MMT influenced crowd, you know, the younger staffers. And so I, I kind of think if it's a, you know, $1 trillion um, deficit increase and a $3 trillion deal that the White House will go along with it, even if Biden himself would strongly prefer to have, you know, to be able to say, I did this huge infrastructure plan and it didn't add a penny to the deficit. I don't think that's realistic. I think they're going to have to live with that. And I think Biden probably will. Yeah. Very interesting stuff. Thanks for breaking it down, Jeff. Great to see you. Thank you, Jeff. Thanks for having me on. See you, Our man. Pleasure. More rising for you after this.